Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, we're going to move over to our next uh, panel discussion. It's actually the final one of the weekend. Um, before we do so, I'd like to take up the opportunity to thank all of the moderators and the speakers for their valuable input uh, into everything that we discussed in the last few days. Um, our last conversation will delve deeper into how a space for nightlife can land in its context. I mean, over the last days we've discussed mostly what goes on within a club. Um, we've talked about the crucial importance of non-mixed spaces, about the decolonization of music, uh, aspects of well-being and uh, also how a club looks like. Um, but in this conversation we'd like to see how a club can be more than a satellite in a city. How can it be a bridge or foster a bridge with its surroundings? Um, so we'll actually discuss how a club can join forces with its neighbors and perhaps find common goals for its further evolution of a city district. If we think about art and culture, we know that they're often uh, exploited and misused in gentrification processes and urban development. Um, so where does that leave nightlife? I mean, if we look at clubs, they're often setting up camp in places in the city that are a bit deemed unattractive or um, that don't really have that much going on for themselves. It's pretty much like artist um, studios and squats. Um, but then in the second phase, this condensation of creativity often turns them into a magnet for project developers. So how can we battle that? Like how can a club that can be tuned in with micro realities um, to set a collective kind of goal course uh, to, to further evolve a neighborhood? Um, our moderator for this final discussion is Julia Ertas. She's uh, hailing from Istanbul. She's the editor-in-chief of the monthly published 21 Architecture and Design magazine. And she's currently doing a PhD at the um, University of Leuven, the Faculty of Architecture at the campus uh, St. Lucas, Brussels in Ghent, uh, with the title Building Knowledge Commons for Commons Architecture. Before, when she was still in Istanbul at the Technical University, she researched the Situationist International and their role in urban development and planning. Um, she will focus mostly on commons architecture, the social impact of spatial practices, and the critical reflections of these. She's also a member of Ocean Design Research Association and CivicWise. Um, I'll let Julia, uh, I'll give Julia the honor of um, presenting our other interesting people uh, joining in on the discussion, and I'll see you after that. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Everyone, I'm Hilia. Um, today we are together with Tayo, Joseph and Garrett. Um, before we start discussing what community building means, um, I would invite all the panelists for the introduction of themselves and their works. Shall we start with you, for example, Tayo? You are muted. Yeah, my name is Tayo Alemi. Um, I, I perform under the name Authentically Plastic. Um, and I run a series of club nights in Kampala called Anti Mass. Um, they started out as parties, really, but have evolved gradually into an arts and music collective. So, yeah, and I'm based in Kampala, Uganda. Um, maybe I'll go next. Yep. Yeah, my name is Gareth Dolan, and I'm originally from, from Dublin in Ireland, but I'm based in New York, where um, I work as a general manager and a programmer at Nowadays, which is an, an indoor and outdoor um, music-oriented social space uh, on the border of Brooklyn and Queens, so just on the outskirts of the city. And um, I've been working in independent dance music culture for approximately 12 years um, in a variety of roles in, in different cities. And um, yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited to be here and to, to talk to you all about um, your perspectives on, on building community. My turn, right? Yep. Um, so my name is Joseph, Joseph Wautis. I'm a scenographer. I come from a background in performing arts and theater, and I um, I run a space called the Cor Atelier in Brussels, which is um, which is a place that, that that works with all forms of ephemeral spaces. And among many things that we do, um, one of the let's say one of the 
somehow main things that we do is work together with collectives from Brussels to organize um, parties. And uh, maybe good to mention that we are based in Molenbeek, which is, um, for those who know, who know Brussels, it's like the canal area where, um, which is named by many as the more problematic area of Brussels, which I obviously don't, don't agree with, but that's, that's somehow the context we operate. Um, I will also give it short intro about myself. I'm Julia. Uh, I'm an architect by education, and I have been doing an architecture magazine based in Istanbul since 2004. I'm at the same time a PhD researcher on the intersection of uh, media, architecture, and the commons at KU Leuven. And also, I have recently started working as a coordinator of exhibitions and publications. Uh, at Flanders Architecture Institute. Um, so, um, for the general rules of the discussion, I think, I mean, we can of course always do a kind of round or two rounds for each question, but I also think it's okay to kind of intervene from point to uh, moment to moment, so it doesn't have to be like, now my turn, I have to talk and I, have, I shall not intervene, but rather I would like to have it more like an informal discussion kind of format that we can then we can keep growing ideas a bit further hopefully um so i will start with the first and maybe most abstract and <laughs> difficult question of the day um how do we define community and if that's a group of people gathered around shared values what are its characteristics in terms of exclusivity inclusivity diversity, and in that regard, what's your perspective on creating a safe space for the community? Um, Joseph, you, would you like to start? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to answer the question, but I mean, I, I have to reread it because you wrote it in the email. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a bit of a difficult question, but maybe I can I, I can um, start from associating on something we talked earlier on the phone about this 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 thing of the safe space. Uh, and maybe just and I'm curious how the others react on it. Uh, I find it also very very difficult um, and uh, dangerous thing to use uh, uh, when when you talk about creating space for party. I see a lot of people using it. I myself don't. Um, but um, maybe just for, for, for clarity, we work together with, um, in the past, we worked together with a collective called Living Dakota, of whom I think in the morning there was someone on the panel of this morning, uh, Celia. Uh, we worked with Hard, Hard Broken, and in the future we will work together with Amari, uh, who will make a, we'll work on a, on a dream or an impossible dream of a strip club for queer POC. And um, Zelda, who is also on another panel, is uh, for working with que uh, for all queens. So you could say somehow that uh, leaving Dakota heartbroken and and the others, uh, they bring in something in the Karatea which we have no knowledge about. Like it's the Karatea is a, is, a, is a place that is run by me and others who build. We build with the, uh, material scaffolding, um, wood, and so on. So when it comes to building a space for those communities which want to make parties at a, in, in, in our uh, old factory. Um, we have we need all the in input from them and the information about what those spaces have to be and what we try to do is to somehow be as flexible and, and adaptable as possible. For Leaving Dakota, for example, we built uh, a different club every event. So the visitors who, who, who come every time, they are surprised with a new space. And that way it stays for us a research and not so much a goal. Like I think the whole building of the nightlife uh, and, and, and the making architecture for nightlife in the Karatea is from the beginning seen as, a, as an exercise or something, a muscle we have to train. And I'm taking a bit of a detour, but it's about this training, the muscle that I, that I think is interesting. That, what I've learned up till now, and I hope I'm going to learn much more the next years uh, by working with different people and different energies and, and the same again and over, and, is that being open or close is some kind of muscle that we, that 
that consists of much more than only architecture, but also the, the doorkeepers and the energy and the music and the, but that this muscle can, and I like to call it a muscle because it means you have to keep on working out and have to keep on training yourselves. Um, and that why I think, or I'm, I'm thinking out loud, why I think this idea of a safe space is very difficult for me to use is because it seems some kind of utopia which you can build and once it's there, it's, it stays. And what we've come to realize and, 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 and um, experience is that a night can start amazing and then some few wrong energies come in and then the music changes and then the, the, the light didn't follow in a smart way and, and there you go, there the safe space is gone. Or leaving Dakota as a very good example, they had been they were fairly underground in the beginning, and then they gave an interview for Red Bull Electropedia, and then we had thousand people on the street who couldn't enter, and then a very carefully constructed energy was was broken. I'm not sure, Julia, if I answered your question, but somehow I I just wanted to kind of talk from experience and less from um, from a theory because. I believe what, what I can contribute is some kind of uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think these e ephemeral um, characteristics of the events and these more like intangible situations have a lot to um, kind of configure what's happening um, in real life. Would you like to keep on going, Hayo? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I I agree. Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky question, but um, yeah, I think I would say that uh, community is a group of people who are gathered around shared values. But then, for me, the the critical thing has always been to figure out what that means with difference itself as a shared value, um, and obviously there's a sense in which uh, there are obviously also forms of difference that are dangerous for difference itself, you know? I think there's a crisis in leftist politics of, you know, tolerance at every cost, even tolerance of, uh, of uh, like, fascistic expressions that are ultimately dangerous for tolerance itself. And, yeah, I think in my experience uh, having events has just been, I mean, there have been a lot of challenges, but I mean, training oneself, because we ultimately want to be open to the people who desire such a space, but then at the same time, you want to keep certain things out. I mean, it is like a, it's a bit of like an experiment, especially here in Kampala, where queer nightlife is very fragile. Uh, so, I mean, if you're experimenting with something, it's like creating a safe, uh, safe environment, like in a lab, keeping certain kinds of like um, any like potential like threats outside to that internal environment. So, I mean, there's a danger in, in this in falling into a certain kind of like exclusionary space. Um, but I mean, we try to be as delicate with this as possible, for example, in, you know, having, uh, it's not really determined in advance, it's based really on the encounter with the door person, um, who would normally be somebody who's like from the community and visibly like gender non-conforming or queer. And yeah, uh, normally whether people get in or out, get in is based on uh, their, that initial encounter with that person. So it's not something we've been, we really want to determine in advance, I think. My turn, Julian. Sure. Um, well, just to your first point about um, definitions of community, um, I agree that a community is definitely a group of people who share values, interests, and goals. Um, but there's also the, the local community, which is, I think, the, the, the definition that you've suggested um, kind of ignores the things that are in immediate proximity. So there's like an ideal community, 
but also then a, a local and physical community. And often they overlap, and that's wonderful. Um, but the reality is that sometimes they don't, and that that um, balance needs to be struck between um, appealing to the ideal community and also people who are perhaps from different backgrounds, but who are also like locally um, in, in, in proximity to, to the community that's existing in a, in a specific space. And in the case of nowadays, um, I would say that that is true. Um, we exist on um, uh, an, in an area where um, there's many different types of people and lots of different perspectives. Um, so our goal is to provide a platform for um, people to be able to exchange ideas um, and to be as hopefully as inclusive as possible. So uh, I definitely appreciate where Teo is coming from um, when they speak about the need for uh, exclusivity as a, in some cases, exclusivity as a as a um, protector of community, and that is it's definitely considered. Um, within our operation as well. But uh, yeah, I just think it's important to point out the two different um, types of, of community um, as, as I see it. Um, as far as a, a safer space uh, policy goes, and I should say safer space, the idea is not to use the term safe space. There's no such thing as a safe space. Um, as long as you have human beings interacting with each other, um, chaos can inevitably arise. Um, so the term is safer space should be used, not safe space. Um, and uh, for us, uh, I agree with Joseph for sure that it's it definitely requires a lot of a lot of work, and it's 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 a uh, it's a difficult thing to to, to fully grasp. Um, but it, it, from our perspective, it's become the bedrock of our of our community, um, and an an integral element of how we um, hire people, how we approach programming, how we um, present ourselves to the world. So uh, while it requires a lot of work, I think that there is a lot of value in, um, in uh, being ambitious with it and, and trying to create a space that feels welcoming and inclusive to all types of people. Um, and that that um, intention is expressed within, within uh, how you, how you present to the world. Um, so obviously it's one thing to say that and then it's another thing to put it in place. And I think that the, the, the more challenging aspect of it is to is the mechanisms that, that you use to enforce um, a, a safer space policy. Um, so I hope that we get to, to discuss that as well because I think that that's the, the meat of it. It's, it's, I think plenty of places kind of pay lip service to it and they say, yes, we are, you know, they put it on their event listing or they put a little flyer up on the wall and it says, we don't do this, we don't tolerate that, we, this is what we're trying to do. We don't actually follow through with it. So we've put a lot of time over the last three years that the, 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 the club has existed um, to define that. And it's, it's, a, it's an evolving process for sure and requires um, input from many different actors. And uh, it's something that we thought a lot of um, Taught a lot of uh, advice on and feedback from people who are directly involved here in the community to, to formulate what we have now. Um, and just so um, for, for the sake of, of, of understanding exactly what it is, our safer space policy states that we have zero tolerance for any violence, any um, non-consensual touching, any um, leering or like creepy staring, um, and any homophobic, transphobic, racist, ageist, or other discriminatory language. Um, and then the means by which we enforce these policies are we employ people from the community who work at our parties. Um, they're identifiable with a red bracelet. Um, so this is a dark environment, so it's like a discreet but noticeable red bracelet. Um, anybody who's having an issue inside the space um, can come to. And everybody who comes through the door, is ex the policy is explained to them. Um, it causes, it, over the years, it has caused, um, been a subject of much debate, I'm sure, because it slows down our process for getting people inside. Um, so this has been problematic, particularly in the colder months, um, when people have to wait for a long time. But it's important to us that everybody understands the, the, the what's the word I'm looking for? The overall goal. Uh, 
for, for the vibe that we're trying to create and what's going to be allowed and what's not. Because I think a lot of people, particularly in this um, city and from my experiences in other cities, won't go to nightclubs. People who have a lot to bring and a lot to express won't go to them because they feel like they will be, they're, uh, they're not safe. So for us, it's, it's, it's extremely important. And um, yeah, I, I, I credit it with a lot of the, the, the success that we've been able to have as a, as a dance music base in the city, for sure. Yeah, I want to to um, thank you because it's also super interesting to hear how you guys do it, and I just wanted to 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 connect to um, what you said about uh, uh, employing the local community or, or or some somehow working with the local community. Um, maybe just a story um, of a learning process that that we had at the car atelier, which was I think quite revelatory or kind of uh, quite 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 interesting. That um, from the beginning, when we were somehow hosting uh, queer POC energies with, with certain desires for, for 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 a safer space, like you say, um, I as as the artistic uh, responsible of, of the space, I was thinking there is gonna be, or I was predicting a certain kind of conflict between that energy and the energy on the street, which uh, around our atelier is. Um, predominantly male uh, yeah, and, and like the street is being somehow monopolized by a group of, of, of up to 100 uh, youngsters with uh, most of them North African roots um, who because of lack of privacy I, I guess at, 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 at home uh, use this, the, the street as they should I think but for many things among others uh, gathering and 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 um, and whatnot and so you know like how from the beginning we were like okay how are we gonna manage this how are we gonna make sure this is not creating uh conflicts and so on and it was quite interesting to see that leaving dakota and and the collective that they invited from paris called fide bledard uh, who did i think the second uh, party they managed to connect much better to those kids than we and they openly invited them to come in, um, hang out, be part of the party. Whereas I probably instinctively would have been more like, mm, maybe this is not a night for you guys. That's not to say that we didn't have conflict because there was quite a lot of non-understanding based on what they were seeing. Or, or, I mean, I remember someone coming to me asking if it was legal that the same, same gender people were making out somewhere. Like it was really a whole thing that we had to somehow manage, but I thought it was, um, a beginning of a process which then I, I also later understood um, on one of the nights that we organized which was not so successful because of the Red Bull interview um, that's actually the, um, the I don't know how, how you call it um, but, but like the, the leftist open-minded somehow people who are very tolerant uh, actually are much more problem, pro problematic in terms of uh, creating the safer space that to make it a bit uh, to, to make it a bit cliche but the, the architects who all feel they are open-minded actually destroyed more in that evening than i was thinking the youngsters from the neighborhood um, could have uh, destroyed and th this took a lot of time for me to also realize that somehow i represent a group that is uh in this specific energy cocktail uh, probably more more the problem than 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 the ones i thought i had to somehow um harmonize how did that play out? How did they, people who you wouldn't assume would be the causes of problems, how did, how did, how did those issues arise? You mean with, with um, the architects? I mean, I'm saying it as a joke, but, but yeah. yes, okay. I, I don't know, there was something, I guess, with entitlement, the feeling that you can be anywhere, uh, you can just right. occupy every space of the discotheque uh, without mm. having to to, to check with other energies which are already in place. And I think that entitlement is, um, is a big problem, especially in the clubs that we design, because we, we do create a lot of spaces of unseeing and see, places of seeing, like we work a lot with darkness and light and we, make, we, we allow for being invisible in, the, in our clubs. Um, and I think the, or I'm guessing that the capacity to deal with those kind of spaces 
and um, the knowledge how to maneuver in spaces where you cannot be everywhere is much higher mm -hmm. with the guys from the neighborhood who in the beginning tend to cling into a corner and then later I was kind of inviting, I mean, I'm saying the space was inviting them to, to maybe share a little bit more with the others. But in a way, having different energies which which have knowledge, and I'm talking about incorporated knowledge of how to occupy spaces together with different energies, is much easier, it turns out, to work with, to create an interesting uh, dynamic in a club than having one group who thinks they can be anywhere and they can dance with anyone and they can touch, you know, and right. that energy is much harder. I'm talking about as an architect, like harder to, to spatialize. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, I find that really interesting because, um, yeah, that's really my main challenge is that with while wanting to have a diverse space, I really try to keep the odds, uh, keep the vibe of the crowd more like in favor of like queerness or like uh, blackness. I mean, this is um, this is a very diverse city already. So it's like just the social material that you're working with already is incredibly varied. Um, yeah, and I also yeah, I also struggle with uh, this thing about like engaging with like the surrounding area or the surrounding neighborhood around like the event space because I mean it has to do with the laws here also it's like um the fact that it's not exactly like legal to be gay or whatever um there's a inclination to kind of like turn your back on things um and yeah i mean i feel like we try to compensate for that really with our like online, you know, online marketing, like having events and uh, distributing like information online as well as uh, via like WhatsApp or whatever. Um, yeah, and I think, I also like to think sometimes of the possibility of uh, like music itself, like the sound itself as being able to like sieve like certain sensibilities. Maybe it's a bit idealistic but I always do think about the possibility of, um, like, if you have a body of sound that is incredibly, like, varied and, like, discontinuous and which prioritizes, like, rapture and a certain sensibility, then maybe it will attract those kinds of people who value those things. Um, I mean, it's a bit hopeful because I think ultimately music is not enough to be able to do such a thing, but in combination with so many other things, I do really think of music as being our, like, bouncer in a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe following the, because some of the questions that we were planning to discuss this one are already brought up. One is this experimental aspect uh, of the, yeah, of um, your works. So maybe, and the other one is the urban context, which we'll discuss more. But maybe we can um, also discuss a bit more this conflict solving mechanisms because um, not only, I think, conflicts not only occur in between the local neighborhood and the community of the club, but also in between the community of the club itself. So, are there any kind of conflict solving mechanisms that you have learned through years or maybe training the muscle, like um, Joseph mentioned? Um, I feel like I, I could share something on that. We have, like every other club, I guess, a, a security team who we rely on to um, protect everybody that's inside. And um, I think, my advice to anybody else who's running a, a space like this is to make sure that the people who you are working with on security fully understand your vision um, and um, that everything everything that that entails is, is, is laid out from the beginning. Um, thankfully, the, the people who have been working for working with us um, and um, providing these services we, we've been connected with for for over 10 years um, in different capacities. The club has existed for three, but before that, um, the, the 
we were a roving party, so we went to different locations, but always with the same security people. So they understood from, from the outset um, when we were building the club um, what, was, what was required. And obviously the physical space changes things, so there are, are details that would need to be updated and revised. Um, and one thing that I've found very helpful is to document everything very, very clearly around uh, the, the sets of expectations um, and to make sure that they are read by um, the people who will be working on the night. So I think uh, clearly communicating expectations can be a way to um, avoid um, these types of, of uh, um, mm -hmm problems that can arise um so that would be the first step in, in dealing with any 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 issues and then beyond that is to is to make sure that there's an, an easy way to um for people who are working a, an event or a party to to make sure that um if an issue does arise these are the protocols that need to be followed you need to do xyz if abc happens um and this takes time and um can only really come with experience so we didn't have this in place from the beginning but it's something that over time as we made sure to go back and always review um the different scenarios and things way pl things played out and if the right decision was made or if something could have been done better it's all informed um uh, our our approach to, to to dealing with um problems as, as they come up so i, I think yeah clearly clearly communicating issues um before during and and in advance or and after rather um is is, is super important yeah maybe i can add something um i think for us the mindset is 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 um or we just decided that we do it because we are interested in conflict so the goal is not to avoid the conflict at all. It is um, really, uh, the goal is not to create conflict either, but it's just like um, a deep interest in in all the conflict which arise out of out of these, you could say intensified or even yeah, intensified desires coming coming together. And, and, and I even like the idea of the fiction, a night, night or a night and a night, night club as some kind of a vessel for a, for a shared fiction that, by definition shouldn't be too um constrained and somehow just uh, like doing it for the conflict really makes it also i guess it's a med meditation technique or something you just you're you're, you're you're you can smile a bit more when it, when it happens and i guess the only thing that we do have as a philosophy within is to, to give time and space to those conflicts which means for us concretely not doing too many parties in a year because you don't have time and space and headspace and, and body uh, physical capacity to do it every week so only having a, a limited amount of we actually applied with the city for a very limited amount of um uh how do you say like permits we could ask for more but we only do six which creates that it's a very valuable thing also i mean i guess to be able to organize something because there's only six slots a year and uh, when something goes wrong like for example once we had a lot of theft that i had uh, five days of evaluation conversations with everyone in, who was running the night and just saying and just having that time and space to allow for those conflicts also i don't know makes it makes it often a joyous thing to to also like one thing we do, for example, is put, put, put carpet in the space. And I don't think a lot of the visitors realize it, but that carpet is so essential because we are in a rough old factory of 150 years old. If we would have just left the concrete floor, there's something. But so always renew, making, making the space new, putting the carpet, building a space only for that night. I cannot look inside the head of the visitors, but I can suspect that it creates some kind of value system in which something else is at play and when you go to a discotheque every friday or something that there's another set of um maybe to end i think we see it also as our responsibility that the people who organize stuff in our venue also have to get the time and the space to take time and space for the conflict which ultimately means how to get subsidies to give to those people so that they're not dependent only on the tickets and the drink 
to run the thing. So how to create time and space for those collectives to also have the time and the space to discuss this, their desires and to discuss what went well and what went wrong and stuff like that. That's obviously a challenge always to find that money. Yeah. Um, I yeah. I do, we don't really have uh, like a solving a conflict solving mechanism either. I think like Joseph said, for us, it's also the ultimate goal is really to avoid conflicts. And yeah, I feel like when conflicts happen, it's really um, uh, dealt with on the spot. I mean, it's because it's a small. It's a, the community is not really that big. So at this scale, there's a sense in which we can do this. Obviously when it gets bigger, then you have to have like certain like real mechanisms in place. Um, yeah, um, but I would say like to avert any like potential for conflict, I would say has, we've always tried to make sure that people who are coming to the party know about the intention of the space uh know what it's about or like know who's playing so um they like just that intention i think it really helps a lot uh and um yeah just uh yeah like i said also earlier like it really rests on how the door person like how the visitor like engages with the door person and it's meant to just be intuitive, like the safety of the internal space really rests on that initial encounter for us. Um, so our thinking is really that if somebody, if somebody reacts violently towards a non-normative presenting person at the door, then like what is that to say about how they engage with all the other non-normative bodies inside? And um, yeah, I think there was, there was uh, one event of ours where there was a bit of a lapse uh, in this in judgment. I think there was, I mean, way later in the party, this, the security always becomes like lax and like more people from outside can come out. So, I mean, there were a bunch of these straight like men who made it into the party. And yeah, I think because the identity of the crowd is always very ambiguous because we don't just have queer people in the space. We have so many friends who are straight as well. So we always think of this mixiness as being something that protects us in that if somebody who like had like kind of like homophobic perspective were to walk into the space, then it would be hard to categorize it as a really like as a gay like event because it would be so mixed already and maybe they would not like call like the police or whatever um but uh yeah i think this one event there were these guys who came in and i think they reacted so viscerally to that very mixedness that <laughs> that we have in our spaces and yeah ultimately it got violent it was actually just one guy but although he did have friends like the one guy was like violent so just like have dealing with a traumatic situation situation like that i think i it's always something that we think has the potential to happen but it's really easily solved by really having a good security team and security team that's from the community itself yeah i just one more point to add i think that specific training and de-escalation if it's possible for organizations that can uh, that can do that is, is super valuable so um systems to calm down people who are extremely aggravated or drunk or high um mm. and um additionally uh, when it comes to drugs if people might be freaking out on drugs and um, people who are trained bystander uh, trained in bystander intervention and can understand what is likely causing the 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 issue either substance wise um or if it's a condition of of something that's happening around them um is, is super valuable too so those those two points are are important for um conflict de-escalation de i would say hmm. maybe it would be a nice transition now from here to this like um the 
personal experiences or stories that you have had during this? Because we have already talked that the community building is happening through a learning process. So it's a kind of a research by doing an experimental lab. So um, are there any stories you would like to share based on your own experiences so that we can also learn from each other, even though the contexts are different, but I think the Um, I, I have a, I've had a lot of different incidents regarding conflicts, de-escalation and, and, and dealing with problems here. We're doing between 100 and, and, and 50 on 200 parties every year. So we do some three, at the beginning it was four, changed to three, sometimes it's four parties a week. Um, and then one in particular stands out, uh, it was a, um, a 24 hour party that we we did um not last summer but the the summer before um we do these on a on a monthly basis and uh the energy at those parties is after a certain hour is usually pretty different to what it would normally be on a on on, 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 your, on your average friday or saturday night um with particularly like uh after hours crowds who perhaps have come from other places and they see that this party is still going um but i had a, a, an an incident whereby um a regular of of the of the, the space who um is um working in in, in he, he sells drugs he doesn't sell drugs in the club but it's what he does outside um came to me and uh told me that there were people in the space who uh, who threatened his life, who threatened to shoot him um, not the, the week prior or a few days prior, and that he felt concerned for his life that they were, were going to try and um, do the same thing at the party. Um, so uh, I had to go and speak to, speak to him, first of all, to fully understand the situation and, 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 and what the context was, um, ask him very um, discreetly to point out who the people who he was referring to, um, who, who, who they were, and, and then go and speak to those people to explain the problem to them about, you know, in the spirit of the, the safer space policy that I just described to say that there is somebody in the space, I didn't name who he was, but I just, they were able to infer from what I told them, um, probably who this person was, but um, I explained to them that there was somebody who was feeling unsafe by their presence and that um they they needed to be aware of that first of all and that also it might not be the best idea for them to 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 be in the space they were they were not regulars of the space um i had never met met them before um and uh they were actually very receptive to it uh they understood they didn't ask any questions and um thankfully they they left peacefully um and uh, and the, the the situation the situation calmed down. But these these are this is a just one example of a of a time when I felt like chaos could could sp could spill over at, at any moment, and that inevitably so many aspects of of public gatherings with various communities can can lead to can lead to um, yeah. Uh, many serious problems but thankfully in, in this case it didn't it didn't spill over um but it just goes back to what i'm saying about i mean security were notified about this as well so i i spoke with this person with the backup of of a, a, a physical presence um and not to intimidate the people who were, uh, i was speaking to about it but just to protect myself um so anybody i would say anybody else who's, who's running who's running physical spaces um should consider approaching issues of, of conflict de-escalation with the help of another person, never to try and do something alone. Um, I've done that and made that mistake before, and um, it, it, it's, it's not one I would recommend. So it's always good to do things in pairs.
Yeah, um, I kind of uh, touched on uh, an experience uh, when I spoke the last time, but I think I'll also just talk about my general experience with the queer nightlife in Kampala. And yeah, I think one of the things I've noticed really is that there's a certain uh, LGBT perspective here that has to do, that seeks to kind of find like status or like power through like aligning itself with like upper class or like bourgeois like values. So, and I think that is really like, it's it really very easily merges with queer anxiety in living in a city like Kampala um, is that a lot of uh, these queer spaces end up becoming very exclusionary along class lines. And it's something that, I mean, you actually have to like really work so hard to have a space that is like, that is uh, exclusionary on those terms because Kampala is a city where like people of such different backgrounds and different uh, social economic groups live in close proximity with each other. But then, yeah, just this recognition of like this really like this intention of like uh, gayness or like uh, queerness being like aligned with, you know, with a kind of like perf certain performance of class. And yeah, we've been really, I feel like that's something that's really common in Kampala, but I mean, we've been had to be really intentional about making sure that our space doesn't degenerate into this kind of bourgeois space that is pretty uh that that occurs uh quite a bit in the gay scene um yeah and it hasn't really been hard for us because already we the party and collective is made up of multiple friendship groups that are already diverse based on these lines as well um but yeah, just uh, we do try to make sure like the dope people are aware of this as well. Yeah. Um, then maybe we can go back to the urban context that we touched a bit upon. Um, because uh, in the case of Tayo, I know the anti-mass parties are nomadic, but in the case of Garrett and Joseph, they are situated in certain urban contexts. Um, so how does the, these both spaces work together? Like, for example, for Decorative Atelier, we have specific programs with the neighborhood. Can you share that? Start sharing now, Joseph? Yeah, and I, I actually it connects to um what i was saying um which i found very interesting also this this problematics of um you call it class i, I, don't, I don't know I, I i guess i know what you mean with that um i don't know if that's exactly what we experience i think in, in my context it's dangerous to call it class but it's it's a constant um challenge to see like i said earlier to see how to not harmonize, but how to make productive the combination of the energy on the street and in the neighborhood with the energy of of the um, of the collectives who organize stuff. Um, I also, like I said earlier, I don't feel like I have all the knowledge as being me to, to and I'm not sure if I'm the well, the, the most um, well-placed person to manage those energies, but as I know, as I can design the space, I do have a tool, I guess. But um, you could say the Guardia, we do many other things. And for example, one of the things we were doing uh, at, the, at the time when we started the nightlife was a, a one year project with a group of, of um, newcomers in Brussels, people with refugee background or, um, but not only, but a very mixed group of people who knew how it is or who know how it is to be new in Brussels and who, to arrive new in Brussels. And they were working on a, on a collective building project. One year, once a week, they would come and build something like a secret garden we were building together. And when we when this energy started flowing, we had the desire to invite them to the nightlife as well, which was met with a lot of enthusiasm and like 
a lot of dreaming and yes next next week we will be there and i don't know how still don't know how to how to deal with that but seeing that they went home immediately after a certain energy in the nightlife started they came a bit too early like at nine already they were there were surprised to find no one and then uh, when the party started happening very quickly they felt it was not their place um and and that's a hard one because obviously <laughs> as, a, as a utopic designer or someone you hope that there is a space where all these energies can be together and and then it's the, somehow sad to see that it's not possible and then adding to those two ener energies also the, the the energy i was describing earlier of the of the guys from the, the neighborhood who are who are hanging out on the street a lot um i think i could call it an impossible desire like uh, something that is bound to to be impossible to have them all like say the urban context or whatever um to 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 keep it productive and this i'm saying it as an impossible desire because it inspires me as a designer to to work with impossible desires is more interesting than to work with the reality but i guess I guess it makes me wonder a lot about what is inclusivity and exclusivity then, because, you know, who gets in and and who not. I think that's that's a hard one. For example, we decided that the guys from a neighborhood they get in for free always, which I think is a very strong choice. I mean, strong not not strong in good or bad, but it's it's a big choice. It's like they don't have to pay, and everyone else does. Like that's that creates a certain kind of different accessibility. I don't know, there's a lot. I don't feel we found all the answers yet to that. Um, we, we do the same thing, actually, Joseph, and around here is anybody who's from the area, who's, I also li live very close to the space, so I, I know the people who are around. Um, and everybody who I meet, um, I explain the intent of the space and always tell them that they're welcome to come down. I always carry drinks tokens to give them like, any neighboring businesses that I go to. My inclination is always to try and start up a conversation, not necessarily about the space, but just in general to find out more about who they are, what they're doing, you know, what, what, they're, what they're trying to achieve um, and, and build rapport with people. I, I really enjoy um small talk to, to to put it frankly and and just simply engaging with people so um i and, and and i always want for those people who have been here longer than we have been here to understand that the space is open to them that this is not some um you know a, a, a sanctuary for people from from somewhere else neighborhoods change very very quickly here as i'm sure is the case in in brussels and, and kampala too um, and new people come in and gentrification happens happens quickly. Um, but it's, it's very important to us that the people who, who are here in the neighborhood um, understand that the space can also be for them. And, and also it comes down to the offering, the type of offering. So the type of music that's played, um, considering the, um, the, the drinks that are on offer, the price points, all of these things to make sure that people don't feel alienated by um, uh, an environment that might be different to what they're used to. Um, so yeah. that, that's, that's, that's important. But I do think that providing complementary entry to, um, to people who are local and people who are um, disadvantaged in, 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 in the community is, is super worthwhile. And I, 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 I think that anybody who would question that um, and who, who, who for, you know, in the case of someone who has to pay, we, we clearly explain it. Like we have a policy where trans people don't have to pay to come to the club. Um, and there's never been an issue where a trans person has been given free entry and a, 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 a gender conforming person has questioned it. Like it's, it's, and if they did, they just, they, you know, if they, if they had to ask the question, we would deny them entry if, if it came down to it. This idea of entitlement is not something we tolerate. Um, so I, I think that it's a worthy, is a worthy idea and, and something that you should follow through with. I, I support that. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear. 
also what you what you mentioned about some others who don't have to pay is something that inevitably we'll have to um start doing now because the, the, we only have six nights a year and we're getting right. a bit too popular so i think we also right. will have to start prior, prioritizing and I, i'm also like as a as as myself i also i'm curious what conflicts are going to arise when when people who look like me have to pay more than others and uh, i mean one thing we said now is that the ones who cannot handle that there's exactly the ones we i guess we don't want to get to have to have inside so that would be a good right. shifting mechanism but also back to uh, while you were saying what you were saying earlier made me made me think of the very obvious um fact but good to repeat is that we are in that neighborhood because rents are quite low. Same here. We have big spaces because rents are low and we can organize parties because rents are low. And that's why we are put in the same neighborhoods of other people who might need low rents. There's no other than a very sad economical truth behind that. And then, and then how to make sure that 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 sadness is not even more sad by people who can't sleep at night. I found myself, for example, last summer before the virus, uh, spending days to find out who to call when you want Uber to change their pickup location. Because a lot of people were actually more complaining from the, the Ubers who were picking up people than wow. from the, the sound, like the slamming doors. And then I found this quite, um, this dystopian thing that in that, I had to somehow find the phone number of the, someone who could please make sure that between 12 o'clock and six, seven o'clock, you can't take an Uber ride in front, but you have to go to the to the parking lot 50, centi- 50 or 100 meters further. But then the other problem came, some people take an Uber precisely because they don't want to do those 100 meters walking away. So how to make, you know, like how to manage this, that the, the people who are not, who don't feel safe to walk in the neighborhood, can get home safe, but still the people who sleep in the street don't have to. That's endless. I mean, it's it's an endless negotiation. Right. Just before we move off the point, the, going back to what you were saying, Joseph, about um, different people paying different prices and not being able to provide free entry for people across the board. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are, I assume, close to the community and who would maybe expect a little bit of a deal. I think in my experience, we, we dealt with the same thing. And, and I think that there are people who will be willing to pay more money because it subsidizes people who have less income. Like for some, this, the space here is small and sometimes we have bigger name DJs who a lot of people want to see. So, or, or different formats of events um, that we have to limit capacity for. So in those cases, we've experimented with um, different ticketing models so that uh, you have like a, a $10 tier, uh, uh, $20 tier, maybe $50 tier. And the people at $50 tier subsidize the people below. Obviously, you can't just give out free entry. It's like it's, you, you can't operate. You can do what you do um, with, with, without, without income. So um, I, I find that that has been a useful way of managing um, the kind of balancing act between ensuring that you have the resources you need to operate and provide for the community um, but then also be aware of those who have less means of um, paying for the, the prices that um, it costs to be a part of the community. Well, and do do the people who are, who want to pay more do they get can they get in faster? And um, no, everybody comes at the same time. Um, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't give provide any 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 privilege in terms of entry. It just means that they're guaranteed a ticket and that in buying this ticket they're expressing that they have the means to. Um, to to subsidize somebody who is less fortunate. And it's not like a, we don't name the people who bought the expensive tickets or anything like that. It's not like they can like, you know, push it about for clout or anything like that. It's, 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 uh, it's just, um, it's, uh, it's just for that, for that means. And I think that people, particularly people in more progressive types of communities, um, like the, the ones we're talking about will be happy to, to make that sacrifice in the spirit of creating an environment that's more mixed, mm-hmm. that provides for various types of people from different class. So that's pre-sale then? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's smart. Yeah. yeah. yeah and what, we, we do it on the door. Sorry, Taylor, just one more point. We, we do it on the mm-hmm. door. Too. So we, we, um, 
we give our hosts the autonomy to make decisions about whether or not people pay the full price or they pay a discounted price based on appearance. Like in the case of trans people, all of our hosts are, are, are able to recognize, well, for the most part, it's not a perfect, it's not an exact science, but they can more often than not recognize someone who is trans and who might therefore be more economically disadvantaged and who might require the discounted price versus, you know, someone who, um, someone who looks as though they have the means to pay the full price. And now we're not very inclined always to use superficial, superficial mechanisms like appearance or gender or age to, to break up the crowd. But um, as, as a way of facilitating this intention to, to reduce the, the, um, the overheads for people who, and make the space more accommodating for people who don't have as much as other people, um, we, we, we see it as, an, as, a, as a kind of a useful way of doing that. You know? But do you refuse as well? Yes, but it's not. It's not. Um, we try to give people the benefit of the of the doubt, and and unless they show signs um, at the door that they're not going to be willing to abide by the safer space policy, you know, we tell people this is the policy. The things that I mentioned earlier on: no violence, no non-consensual touching, no leering, no discriminatory language. Mm -hmm. If someone makes a gesture like turn to their friend and they roll their eyes or they say something like what's all that about it's just like you're not welcome here then it's okay not tonight go home and they don't come in um but mm -hmm. and, and, and in cases say if there's a group of uh, a group of straight males um we require affirm uh, affirmation in that case so we would ask that everybody y'all on board with that you agree you understand and everybody has to say yeah nod their head anybody who's like no mm -hmm. But we don't have too many issues. Mostly, it's people are chill. Yeah, yeah. We kind of experimented with that kind of uh, variable, varied pricing system in the beginning, uh, where cis men used to pay like double price, and yeah, we didn't really have problems with it except just for a few people. Um, but yeah, I think I think that strategy is also like really helpful. Um, because like whenever somebody would object which it was very few people then it means ultimately they don't really get that this is a femme centered space because yeah ultimately it was this pricing mechanism was put in place so that we could have a space that is femme dominant and queer dominant and yeah obviously cis men in kampala especially have a lot of access uh, to like resources, to money, to jobs uh, that queers and femmes don't have access to. So, um, yeah, if somebody di didn't really understand that, then they weren't let into the space. I also see this kind of different uh, price category tactics, I would say, also as a form of solidarity in between the community. Because if you can afford, and if you want to have a nice night out, you 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 can contribute to the community in that sense. And probably during the night also, you have solving small problems, like at least not letting the violence escalate, like pulling down people. These small things are, I think, they are only possible in this more like community. Uh, feeling uh, environments. 100% agree. Definitely. Um, maybe, maybe I just want to, uh, just one more thing that's on my mind about this is that as an um, organizer, I also do notice that it's nicer when people didn't pay too much. In general, it's like I totally and I'm very um, grateful for the input about these different prices. But on top of that, there is, as a designer, as an organizer, a desire for uh, an audience that doesn't that comes in and is not feeling like they like I I don't want to feel that we owe them something. And I noticed now with with COVID, we organized we had a some summer festival which we made everything for free. Um, and that was the extreme, and I don't think it's financially um, feasible for a long-term vision, but um, the relaxation 
that when it has to be cancelled last minute because of rain or because of it's just like guys we we owe you nothing like we when it happens and then you're here and then you you're we're, we're not going to charge you a lot of money the, the drinks are quite cheap but that also means we expect you to I, I have a feeling that it's a subtext that also says you have to make it yourself here. We're not going to cater. We're not going to provide. If there's no lemon in your gin and tonic, we don't want you to come and complain. And, you know, like, so there is this, I don't know, there's this, there's this, I guess there's, there's this subtext, which I guess you can communicate through your prices that also says which state of mind we expect you to have. I 100% agree with that. I'm glad you brought it up because I think that not only it's an important indicator for, um, the types of people that you want to attract, but I think that also the the feeling on the behalf of guests that they are being accommodated and that they're um, it's reasonable will create a better vibe inside. Like people don't feel as if they're being squeezed economically. Um, exactly. And, and 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 in fact, I think in in these instances, people are more likely to spend money, mm -hmm. uh, and they will have a second drink or a third drink versus paying a high price to come in. And then a high price for the, to leave their jacket in. And then all of a sudden you start adding all these numbers up and it's like, well, you know, I've already spent X percentage of, of my disposable income for this night. And, and then you're more closed and you're not as, as free and open. So I, I do think that it's better to err on the side of making things um, uh, affordable generally than trying to um, squeeze more from, from, from the entrance and mm -hmm. all differences in prices are very important. And in a way, it's linked yeah. to the earlier thing we were talking because the last thing I would want as a, as a club uh, owner is that the ones who pay more feel even more entitled to have everything. Okay. And it's like, whoa, then I'd rather let them in for free if they should. Exactly. This yeah, that's the, a challenge that we had, that we had uh, with this kind of thing that we noticed like in the behavior of people that it really made like men, cis men even more entitled to the space. And yeah, I mean, ultimately like the cases of like violence or like disturbance that we've had has been, was like more in that time. So now uh, we've just made it affordable all across the board and ultimately entrance just rests on whoever is working the door. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Maybe from here we can move to the more spatial configuration or the architecture of the club. Um, how does it affect the event? Event uh, because Joseph already mentioned in the beginning like there are some niches to see, to be seen. These kind of different spatial configurations are also affecting a lot the interactions in between the community. Um, so how do you see the effect of architecture in community building for clubs? Yeah, um, I'll speak from the, I mean, from my experience in Kampala, I mean, there is, with a lot of clubs, I feel like there's this whole thing that I, my friends and I call lounge culture, <laughs> which, um, yeah, a lot of clubs are kind of like designed in this way, like, you know, like little like sitting spaces, even though it is like a nightclub. Um, there's a kind of special configuration that encourages a certain kind of clickiness, and like discourages like the chance encounter um so i think yeah I, I really i really do respond to that in choosing spaces in that i i try to go in order to create a space that's intense i try as much as possible to think about like the scale of the space in proportion to the like people who are going to attend I think like intensity is generated from like the crowding of bodies together. And I mean, occasionally I'll even like consciously like choose a venue that I know it might be like a little smaller than is necessary. Um, yeah, for the party to like spill over into the outdoor space. Um, I don't know, I think 
considering the very like clickiness and judginess of Kampala, I think uh, such a space doesn't really leave enough room for judgment because ultimately judgment like requires distance from the other. Um, and yeah, you ultimately want to be in a space where like people are really gonna like be engaging with each other and like, for me, yeah, that's what inten that's where the intensity comes from. It's just, like from that like crowding without it being unsafe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um I I think the 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 space of the nightlife or the discotheque is is, is why we do it. And uh uh, also, uh, as the Quartier, it's it's the from the beginning in the negotiation or the talk with the the people who are hosting it. It's it's a clear sign that that's what's in it for us. Which, as a side note, I also feel that it's uh, that 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 it's um it's a very transparent way for us to interact with collectives which do come something completely different than what we do as a core business. That we are not in for them tagging us on Instagram. We are not in for um, their community loving us. It's not we don't want to be them. There's a clear um, interest from our side, which is architectural and spatial. And I think apart from all the the the, the um, parameters, which I think are important and which were discussed this morning, and and, and Tayo, you're also bringing it up, like closeness and distance and visibility and invisibility and being seen and being and looking out yourself. I think space as a tool is also very handy to to talk before with the organizers. Like how do you want the space to be? Which I've come to which I notice is a question not like a lot of or that is a question which which for some of the 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 organizers that we work with is a very uncommon question to get that you can really talk about square meters and levels and colors and and distance and not this is the given space and you can put your decoration but somehow like really negotiating the the the, the, the square meters it is a tool that is that is i wouldn't call it emancipatory but at least it, it forces you to think about um how do i want to host my own community it is a tool that also forces those collectives to take responsibility themselves because if it's going to be a bad space it's not the institution that, that that did it wrong it's also your own and it's a vocabulary that you can make prior to the event which is way easier to talk prior than during the night um about about this stuff and i did that's why I, I value it so much so it's not only because i'm obsessed with clubs and the history of clubs and 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 all the legacy of all the amazing people who did it before but also because i think it is one of the more powerful communication tools to talk about spaces for 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 um, yeah for for specific energies and then i mean i don't know if this is the place for it but i would love to discuss the parameters of it but i think more as a as a as a broader thing i, I that's my interest in yeah that's super cool and i'm always envious of 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 um people who have the, the flexibility, more flexibility to uh, event uh, um, event creators and people who design space for, for parties that I, I'm envious of them because they, those who have more, um, less defined structures, because this is a seven day a week operation and we do things beyond, beyond parties. We do like right here on the dance floor where I'm sitting, we have all these tables set up for right now during COVID, it, we're only allowed to do it in, seated dining so even before covid we would operate as um like a bar and a restaurant during the day and then at 10 p.m we take the tables away um so certain things about what we're able to do with our space are restricted by the types of offering that we um need to need to provide in order to be able to run a space uh, like this the, the here is an indoor and an outdoor um space and and uh the outdoor is um 16,000 square feet inside is uh, 4,000 square feet. So the outside is really, really big. Um, and uh, it provides a, an opportunity for, because it's so big, it provides an opportunity for lots of different tribes within the community to be in the space and um, try it out as, as the way I see it before, um, before at least be, like before COVID, and then kind of like entering into the environment more and to mingle with people from 
who are also in the community but who are not known to them necessarily. So I do think that like large spaces um, can offer that uh, and that it can be um, a definite benefit. But to Teo's point about uh, when it comes to parties and the, the creating, a, pulling the lever of intensity, the smaller spaces with more people, um, although it can be uh, perhaps uncomfortable on the dance floor sometimes if things are close, but where given the right circumstances musically, um, I think it lends itself to a, an energy that's, that people can, can really enjoy and appreciate. Um, I do think for, um, for longer parties and, and for people's comfort levels, it's very important to make sure that there's a, it's not too crowded for too long. Um, and so that it, you kind of monitor how long it might be, it might be intense for, and then say no more at the door, let it cool down a little bit, bring it back up. Um, and, and, and try and be conscious of exhausting people because our hope is that you can, can have long parties and people can enjoy it for, for many hours, not just one or two hours and go home. Um, as regards dancing, and uh, we, I always think that it's important to, um, I mean, not, not necessarily important, people can dance on whatever surface they, 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 they want to and, and some people can do it for longer than others on different surfaces, but a wooden floor I always find is is much more comfortable if there's an option for um, uh, to, to do a party in a space with a wooden floor. It's always that's a good sign for me. Um, and uh, ventilation is is another very important thing. Um, we have um, air conditioning units. It's a requirement of the the city that we would have air conditioning units anyway. Um, so it's a, it's a like a, a building code issue. But I, I think it's very beneficial not necessarily to run it all the time. You know, it's nice to pack the room, make a crazy sweaty environment and then cool it down, right? turn on the AC really, really high and change people's sensory sort of environment by doing those types of things. So um, I think that um, it's, it's important to, to, to ventilate for obvious reasons. Um, I am also a huge advocate of not necessarily an architectural thing, but I guess it can change the way the architecture is interpreted, but um, of uh, smoke, like a fog to, to like change the vibe sometimes fill it up bring it down let it go steady um and i think uh it, it, it's it's a it's a cool effect um and uh there was another point that i was going to make about the the physical structure of the space i'm trying to look around oh yeah so so um na natural natural light i i i think that the in, in certain circumstances it can be a really beautiful thing like if you just made it through a long night you know it's the sense of a journey um and if, if there's an option for, for the, the room to be to fill with light in the morning time, it's, it makes for a special twilight, um, twilight vibe that I think is, is uh, exciting. Uh, every, thank you. I really love it when it comes down to these, these kind of really almost geeky technical details, which, uh, which, um, I think you can make an endless list of, 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 of things which are part of the architecture. And I love it if you discuss uh, the space for party that it can, it can really branch off to, to smell and to, you know, but it's very easily, not with, without, without becoming um, too poetic or something. It's, it's always quite real. I also love it that the space is always the space that you talk about is always different than the space that is in your head as a partier, like uh, as, an, as a, as a self-partying architect, I, I feel that the space in which you party, it happens more in your head in the end than, than it is actually in, the, in reality. And I also had it often that people came to Decoratelier during the day and then talked to me about a club they were in this neighborhood once and talked about this, this far away space until they found out it was the space where we are at the moment, but it's just taking place somewhere else. I, 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 I would dare to say that that space resembles more like a grotto, like a cave in my head often because it has, because time plays a role. Like you walk in from the daylight and then maybe it's a tunnel, you know, like you, and everyone has a different tunnel and you meet sometimes and then you go out again. And so this, this temporality of the space, I think is, is beautiful because it it means there is as many spaces as there are people in in the room but 
uh, as for my me and i think every designer has other uh dadas or other uh interests but one of the things that i find interesting is how to divide the wanderers from the one like how to allow for wandering without disturbing others because i myself i really one of the things i love the most in nightclubs is to go around and to, to fall into unexpected encounters but in bad clubs and i think most of my knowledge i got from bad clubs or from spaces where i wasn't feeling happy is when the wanderers are just wandering through the people who are dancing and, and then when there's too much and that often has to do with the positioning of the bar the positioning of the of the toilet and somehow not enough liminal spaces in which to to, to go around i think those liminal spaces are super important also the when we design clubs we often try to be very specific about where we place attention and then allow for dead angles where we have like no idea what's going to happen here and often those are the places which are appropriated by people temporarily or by people who need more space to dance or but just to to not want to know everything that do not want to define every corner just to to leave that angles and the last thing i really enjoy is is the element of danger which i guess is easier if you're a temporary club who can uh, but somehow fire uh, a little bit too low ceiling somewhere or a pole you can climb onto and i think that if you do it only six six times a year that's that's a that's something i think is manageable if it's five times a week i guess you you, you can't have the element of insecurity or danger but for me this is important because you know like if you feel as someone who comes to the club that not everything is calculated on the the most the biggest asshole who's going to misuse it or the biggest crazy person who's going to break it if the space is vulnerable and is allowing for vandalism and is not yet is not yet fearing all things that might go wrong it also makes me more sensitive and i guess it's a question for you gareth like how do you deal with with this with with you know like insurance and, and danger like the yeah um well it's, it's it's something that we obviously try to limit um to an extent but to to make the space feel not so not not rigid is super important to to creating a, a sense of a flexible uh environment and there are aspects of the space that we can move around to to suit um to suit like that intention um but additionally in 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 New York, and I'm sure it's the case in many other cities, like if you want to run uh, a seven day a week brick and mortar establishment, you have so many, like you wouldn't believe the amount of, of requirements that you need to meet to, 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 uh, to just get a license to be able to open and, and, and invite people inside. It's all these inspections from the fire department, from the department of buildings, from the department of health. It's, it's, it's really, really, really crazy in this city. So, um, they are very conscious of um, egress for fire exits, um, making sure that there's you know enough space for people to be able to move, um, and uh, limits on capacity, um, all these types of things. So in New York, uh, they they take that very 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 seriously, and it limits our ability to do what you're saying, Joseph, and and, and leave things a little bit in disarray, or have a cable hanging from the wall, or like some exposed brick that's loose or something like this that kind of creates this kind of like other sort of world and it needs to be um it needs to be up to their standards in order for us to exist which you know is 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 um can be a good thing and a bad thing depending on who you ask um but one other point that I, I, I want to make about um, the physical space that I think is important, particularly for people who are interested in um, in, in throwing parties and with the intention of, of building community, a community is space for people to sit down. I feel like I've gone to so many clubs and venues where I can't I have to stand up the whole time. And this is not conducive in any way to um, to bonding with people, taking a moment away to replenish and then to go back and do whatever you were doing. I think it's often overlooked and um, something that we try to do here, we put couches around the dance floor and then there's a, another section down closer to the bar where you can sit, where you can sit down and it's also a useful part of the, the outdoor space that we have and that there's adequate seating out there. So I would suggest to anybody who's um, who, does, who, who throws parties or um, is, is looking at 
making a space for them um, that the seating is, is not overlooked. I think often people look at seating as like, oh, it's going to reduce my capacity so I can't get as many people in the door so I can't make as much money. But it, it, I think in the long run, it, it, it works um, against, um, against people who are trying to create space for, for community building. Um, I find the, the thresholds actually very interesting, like the sequence of spaces, especially when you are entering a space. So it's like this line maybe, and then because the line itself can also be a space you start talking to people uh, at the front or back. Um, and probably there is this smaller space where you are first welcome and then you enter to this a bit wider room when the whole energy is happening i find this like threshold of entering that last room last space very exciting every time it's with all the as Gert mentioned with all the lights maybe the fog and the smoke it's, and also i really miss it <laughs> now <laughs> um I try to a bit escape from this reality, but maybe it's hard to um, dismiss totally the reality of the COVID pandemic. Um, but maybe we can discuss it, especially in the light of the community, because with all this distancing and so on, the interaction between people are now different, but we don't know if, how long this uh, pandemic will keep going, etc. But maybe for the post-COVID uh, situation, how do you think the community will come back together? Especially these kind of bodily moments, like being together in a space, being packed or Um, I was enjoying not having to talk about COVID for for an hour there. It was like going back in time. Um, but I'm glad you brought it up because um, I think this, the 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 strength of a community, and, and and certainly I feel this way about nowadays. It's um, it really shows in, in in difficult times when when you can come together and and, and um, mix in real life. It, it, creates different pressures. But one thing that I have been extremely grateful for um, is the, the, the advancements that have been made in technology to be able to, 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 to bring people together and to be able to um, leverage real life communities to, to um, create worlds and, and um, even extend a community online. And this is, this is something that um, we undertook um, in March shortly after the day literally the day after that we had to close we we set about um figuring out how we could create uh, uh an outlet for people in the same way that we did in, in normal times um and uh provide a sense of of togetherness when everybody was uh, in extremely isolated and in quarantine so through the help of this is another a good example of community in action. There is a radio station in New York called the Lot Radio, um, which is actually run by a Belgian guy. Um, his name is Francois, who's a, a saint as far as I'm concerned. And um, he he uh, we got in touch with him about um, broadcasting equipment and software um, to uh, be able to invite DJs that we would ordinarily book to play in front of a packed room to do um, recorded sessions from, um, from the booth here. Um, so he came down completely of his own time, gave up his time um, at no cost and helped us install um, two cameras and uh, a broadcasting computer to be able to live stream um, uh, DJ sets and workshops and tutorials and various other um, sort of like content um, that we, that we um, then placed on our website and in our messaging and newsletters and Instagram, whatever, directed people to. And uh, there was a chat room there. And the chat room 
kind of served as a way for obviously not everybody because there's some people who are varying degrees of tolerance for for online things myself included but um i think for a lot of people during that time um it um it provided a, a, some solace and some connection um when they maybe you know live in a situation where they they don't have a partner or they don't have roommates who they can who they can feel connected with um and um there was some some really tremendous um um outpourings of appreciation for that to be honest with you and it enabled like by doing that it enabled us to to also sustain ourselves because in conjunction with the broadcasting um program that we did and it was also local djs but also international djs um who had played in the club previously and who we wanted to um to maintain connections with and um, they contri made contributions and then we were able to uh, set up this um it's like it's this thing called a, it's called a patreon it's like a it's like this uh, subscription service where um creators of like you probably all heard of it before there's probably different versions of it perhaps in, in in different regions but um this gave us a means of generating income at a time when we were completely closed and um in conjunction with the patreon there's we also sent out um uh, a means of supporting our our staff and our DJs and vulnerable mem members of the community through um, like a it's like an app where you text money. So we put it out to people who within our community who were still employed who had the means to to be able to um, contribute to people who, um, for example, weren't able to claim unemployment benefit, um, undocumented workers um, of of uh, who we, we who we have in our community and um, so we were able to take uh these resources from more uh um more affluent more people who had more means and relocate them to places where the need was required um i.e to cover some basic costs of operating here but also to provide income for people who didn't have any um, at that time and in i'm sure it was probably the case in Actually, I, I would doubt that anywhere else in the world has responded as poorly to the, to the pandemic as, as the United States has. I think that the numbers show that. But it took so long for people to in the community to get any unemployment benefit or get any grants or do any of these things. So um, all of this, this COVID experience has kind of emboldened my belief that um, community can thrive under good circumstances and also under extremely, really difficult ones. Um, and that the hard times actually serve as a better means of like connecting people and, and making, emboldening the foundations of, of, of a community, if you think about it from an architectural perspective. So um, obviously it's come with enormous stress and, 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 uh, and difficulty for so many, but I think that in, in other ways, this period has, uh, has um, provided a, an alternate sense of relief that perhaps people didn't realize uh, existed. I, I don't think for a second that it's a replacement for real experience. Like I mean, when I say real, I mean in person uh, experience. But um, I, I do think that there's um, new forms of community able to exist because of because of these technologies and and because of the the changing circumstances. I don't think it's going to be very long before we're back to doing real life stuff. I'm very hopeful um, by this time next year, for example, that we'll be you know setting up dark areas and changing the lights here and adding buying more smoke juice um for the for the fog machine and all those types of things but um in in the in in, in since then uh i think that there are things to be hopeful for and and uh, the community is is not it's not gone it's not it's not come and it doesn't, and it doesn't need to necessarily come back it needs to come back phys physically but virtually and i, I think it's it's, it's it, in my experience it continues to exist but I mean, I've been fortunate in that we had the connection with the lot radio and we have a, a physical space here to be able to broadcast this. I'm sure it's very different for um, someone in Tao's position who is an independent promoter and might not have a physical means to be able to, to come together. And it's a different, it's a different uh, experience then um, and, uh, and, and more challenging. And I would really love to hear their perspective on what they've been able to do as a, as a roving promoter without a physical space in, 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 a, in a time like this. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I think for me, COVID has brought up, 
has made visible to me how much of you know my own like queer expression has been taking place in nightlife or um within you know like the dark room the dark space of the club um yeah so like i've really been you know trying to think about you know what is queer expression then without you know the club and you know without nightlife especially because there's also a curfew here that has been in effect most of the year of like 9 p.m so this impossibility of having like nightlife events um aside from the fact that it would also be irresponsible um yeah it's just uh made me consider like more like the possibility of having events like in outdoor spaces um yeah because i mean ultimately i mean kampala is a troubled city but it's also very beautiful and i've just been thinking more about you know this uh the possibilities of having stuff like more outdoors or even daytime uh what does queerness look like uh within uh, within those uh circumstances um i think uh yeah the only online event that we were able to do this year was uh was uh, the boiler room streaming from isolation um so i mean and in that way we were also able to like support our community which was uh our community with the funding that came out of this project as well by partnering with other um queer organizations uh like the tala foundation um yeah for us it's really it's really been ultimately because of uh, internet access here it's not really accessible for all people so i mean for us our focus this year has really just been on um trying to take care of our community and check in on them and working together with other grassroots organizations that do this kind of work because i mean we have interest in the community but we are very much um focused on uh on nightlife and creating like community space but yeah just engaging with other people in the city who are actually making sure that people have the queer people have safe housing the trans people uh have you know adequate support as well um i think that's that's really been the focus this year and yeah i think if anything like i said um the covid experience has kind of opened me up to the possibility of having like space outside you know and yeah just all the potential like challenges that can come out of that as well being in this context yeah yeah as as um as as our main interest is, is space there was zero joy moving online <laughs> as i imagine for many but i guess uh, but but Celia from uh, from uh, living 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 Dakota, who uh, is resident. Um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, um, mentioned something which I think was quite eye opening for me, um, uh, and made me realize that I I'm a timid dancer, right? I'm 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 not um, a trained dancer, and I'm I'm rather timid. I need I need a lot of people in the club, and I need. I'm, I'm, you could more say I'm a princess dancer. Like I need so much to be good before I can start dancing. That's like um, sometimes annoying to be. Um, but in regard to touching, it was quite interesting because she back then said, um, "This might give us an opportunity to reconsider the role of touching on a on a, on a dance floor." And I realized I need it. I need to be shoulder to shoulder, and I need. And um, that was quite inspiring. For for but I mean, just so to hear that 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 I mean I knew it obviously but to to have time and 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 a whole summer to 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 think about the space that it created through through the fact that you have to distance uh, and and the fact that it it benefits um, you could say more trained people or or more engaged people and that it, this benefits timid dancers like me there is some kind of um, an, um, possibility there so what we did um was uh, of course as a main 
goal for the summer was how to pay DJs, which is just uh, in a way just hoping to to get all the people who don't have an income anymore to to find reasons to pay them. But we also found some joy, not a lot, but some joy in organizing events where um, the distant dancing had to take place, or or, or where do you can we we could somehow juggle and play a little bit with with um, other physical and it was mostly legal and sometimes kind of on the verge of of what was allowed at that moment in Belgium but never 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 uh, ir uh, ir ir irresponsible another thing i think was uh, there was an uh, in the summer uh, possibility to also due to the fact that only very limited amount of people could come together there was a possibility to to experiment with 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 group formation and exclusivity secrecy like not announcing it without feeling guilty without the whole ethical thing of how oh, should we what would you know like if you only can come together with 50 and we have the we are one of the few spaces which can do it then maybe we allow for one or two or three times some kind of secrecy for a minority group that wants to come together and i think that was quite we learned a lot from that and um now with um somehow a light at the end of the COVID tunnel we are planning now to um to go slowly back and to really appreciate all the um, hopefully uh, relaxations of the rules like if march june july august up to next winter um we are hoping to to create time and space and and, and experimental space to hopefully come back in a club which is a little bit um, which might, might be different in 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 unwritten rules of touching for example and and hoping to somehow keep something from those that distance to come back and make it a little bit more livable for some people who were who were totally not happy with the unwritten rules of touching prior to the pandemic but obviously all of that is only possible and i i feel i feel like i need to say that within the context of of a subsidized country because all of the time and space that we that we have been able to give is because belgium provides for, with sub subsidies and i think that's uh somehow one of one of the main uh roles i think of the karate is to give those subsidies and pass them on to to um to create temporary spaces of autonomy for groups of people who then during the pandemic and hopefully also after don't have to have the pressure of 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 income because only when we can take this off for a moment the, the pressure of selling tickets there there is a space of rethinking a little bit or, or playing with with um other questions um maybe it will be a bit repeating myself but what do you think about um if we go back to a kind of a normal life after the pandemic what would be the bodily interaction again like would, would we be feeling secure being in a uh, on the dance floor i think that depends on who you ask like there's uh, from my, my observation um in new york there's lots of different types of perspectives on on this virus and different tolerances for different proximities to other people like there have been five six hundred seven hundred person raves that have happened illegally there have been people who have not left their house so it's a huge spectrum and i think that um i don't think that there's <clears throat> i think there's been more people who will be craving engagement and will be less risk averse particularly in like progressive circles um with the assurance of a vaccine that works which i guess we have now um so i i feel like this culture will come back stronger than ever before personally um when when that time comes but um i don't think it's going to happen in the next three months i think it's probably going to take 
take until the end of the summer into the winter of next year by the time the logistical constraints are worked around with 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 um, issuing vaccines and you know systems are figured out to be able to verify whether or not someone has actually received a vaccine or hasn't or, you know there's obviously lots of work to be done but i i think that um i think that people will be absolutely craving it and that and for the most part and will really really want it i know as i was speaking from my perspective and the perspective of my friends and my community here um i think that that's that's the majority of people and maybe masks will be very common i think that people maybe will be more inclined to wear masks um which i don't think is a bad thing you go to asia where they've had other scares with pandemics and if somebody's feeling sick you know they might have something that might infect somebody else they're putting a mask on going on the train i, I honestly i think that that's a, a step in the right direction because there's less of a chance of you infecting somebody else if you do that so um yeah like everything with this i'm just trying to keep uh affirmative and and um positive positive mindset for it because that's yeah i i i think that there's only only good things that will not only good things but pre predominantly good things that will come of of this experience it will strengthen people I think I think also it will I definitely like I'm of the same view that it will really come back stronger than ever. Um I feel like from my environment people are really like craving that. Um you know like the club space and to be able to interact with many people. Um I think maybe it also has to do with the fact that the population in Uganda is mostly young. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just even walking around my neighborhood, it's, it's really, I don't get the sense of there being like much, you know, anxiety about like other people or other people's bodies. Um, it really just looks like just another day. The only difference is that there's a curfew and that has totally shut down nightlife, even though there are some clubs that are running, like through like bribes or whatever. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think, um, I think it will definitely come back like in full force, at least once there's, you know, assured security or a vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no one's gonna wanna go home anymore, I think. They're just gonna stay all the time. I hear people now going back years in the memory and thinking, why did I go home that night? <laughs> so I think it's going to be very difficult to, to close. Maybe we can, with this kind of optimistic uh, perspective, maybe we can have a look at if there are any questions and then pass, pass them on to you. Hey, um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for sharing all this. Uh, we have a few quest questions indeed. Um, yeah, one was about what's something that came up earlier in the conversation. Um, it's uh, the topic about leftist uh, politics in the cl in clubs. Uh, you touched a bit up upon it, uh, Josef. Um, and actually, it's, it's a question from Katarina, uh, where she asks, um, could it be that over time um, the, revol the revolutionary aspect of clubs got lost and that we need a, a new approach? Maybe it's both for you and both for Tario because I also have brought it up. Yeah, I don't feel like I, I can say something meaningful, so maybe maybe Tario, you want to check? I'll think of it. Okay. Um. Yeah. I um, I think the revolutionary potential of the club is still uh very much alive. Um. Uh. Maybe. I just subscribe to the feeling that 
wherever like the bodies are gathered, you know, um, there you have po politics, or at least the potential for politics. Um, so yeah, I don't think yeah, I don't think even remotely that the club has died. I think it can lose its charge over time. Maybe it has in some places, but like ultimately, like the gathering of people together, I think wherever that is, there's room for politics or, you know, just hedonism, but the possibility for politics is always there. Um, I don't know if this addresses the question. I'd like to weigh in on that, sorry. Um, I think that revolutions happen every day and every night in clubs in tiny ways for different people at different times. And that if that's the definition of a revolution, I think that um, the clubs is, 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 is the perfect breeding ground for it because there's all this um, sense of experimentation going on musically, socially, uh, and if you're doing it right, bringing different people and presenting different perspectives to people that can create a revolution in their minds. For the example that Joseph just mentioned earlier on about how you can bring people from the immediate community, the local community, in to uh, a space where they're seeing things, you know, that they have queer people, um, um, old people behaving in, in, in ways, straight people behaving in ways of that they, they hadn't seen before. I think that this could spark a revolution in them and then that they can go on and, and then within their social circles they, they explain what they saw and maybe shift some perspective. So I think clubs are, have been doing that, will continue to do that. Um, and that it's, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it hasn't gone away and it won't. Um, in terms of a, a, like a mass social revolution that's going to uh, sweep the, the whole world, um, I think that that is, I don't want to rule it out, I don't think it's impossible, but I think it, it's super ambitious. Um, but I have tremendous respect for anybody who believes that the club and music and this form of cultural expression is a means to create that, and, um, and I, I support it, and uh, I hope that, from my perspective, that we can we can um, provide a platform for, for that voice as well, because it's, 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 a, it's crucial. Mm. Now that I hear you talk, it is true that um, during the pandemic uh, and in Brussels, most uh, the month of June was quite political and, and uh, a lot of the people who were organizing stuff in the Karatier, um and the party, the party or, or, or organizers were very active in this, in the, in the, the uprising or the the protests, um, and as somehow an ally, but also outsider to that, I, I do think it's. And I'm very curious, what's going to happen when, when one, when this this amazing tool that produces so much energy, which is the club, which is club club culture, is going to be brought into that, again. And yeah, perhaps there is high hopes that 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 crucial tool of music and bodies and, and gathering. Yeah, I'm curious. Because in a way that's, that's been missing. Yeah, I really like uh, what Guy said about like, uh, you know, all these small revolutions happening in all these spaces. I feel like the term revolution is really loaded because I mean, people really associate it with, you know, this like intense, you know, like, orgasmic expression of like the public in the streets. Um, but I think like not enough value is put on, on this kind of perspective of like the immun imminent revolution, you know? What happens in the morning after the revolution, you know? Um, ultimately the club is, is really like, is really instr instrumental for this type of revolution and for politics i think just being in a space where you can encounter other people who are like different a space where you can encounter difference itself and um having it be like more intense i think it's it's really it's just important
Mm. I would just add a small part to that because I see also revolution connected to this idea of radical imagination, which I also think this last summer I was also thinking, okay, now we can be in the public space, but what are we going to do in the public space? I mean, the public space is not allowing any other actions than just like sitting and drinking beers almost by its design. So the, this kind of, it, it felt mostly as if like it, this pause a little bit made me rethink the imaginative powers that we have been lacking for so long and like just accepting the situation as it is. And yeah. Yeah, I think revolutions and uprisings and um, mass movements of, of social change are only only a positive thing. I think they all help us to grow. And I think that that's what will come of the movement for black lives, particularly in New York. Um, and uh, I hope around the world, and, and particularly as regards um, an awareness of the roots of club culture. It doesn't come from straight white people. Um, it comes from, from queer black culture. Um, and queer Latino culture, particularly here in, in, in New York. So um, I think that the, if that's if that's on people's minds, um, we all stand to benefit from it. Um, so yeah, I'm all for for the micro and macro revolutions. Full support. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, another question from from Tina. Um, who I think is calling or living in, in Malta, actually. Um, what would you uh, recommend to those interested in growing or, or gathering a community if they don't really have a physical space at their disposal? Um, and she says because she's, she's living in Malta, uh, s squatting in Malta is very difficult to the, to, to the policy uh, because of uh, how tiny the, the island actually is. Um, it's, it's hard to go outside of the radar. Any thoughts on, on that question? Um, I would suggest, first of all, to anybody who's trying to uh, establish community, um, not to be shy, not to ever be retiring or afraid of making a mistake. I think it's very important that people put themselves out there and take risks and get outside their comfort zone um, and ask questions of people that they might not be um, immediately comfortable asking. Um, and uh, in a practical sense, I think that amounts to perhaps going to other businesses um, in areas where you are interested in, in creating space and asking them what they did. Um, I think email, call um, is probably better in the age of a pandemic um, or trying to find a time to have a coffee and just learn their perspectives um, is, is, it could, be, could be super beneficial. and. Um, Beyond that, I think that you don't need a space, as Teo has proven, and as so many other independent um, promoters have, have proven, you don't need a physical uh, space always. It's, it's often possible and, and, and usually perhaps more interesting if, there's, if the space changes all the time. So um, if it's there, it's also in, in, I would recommend starting with uh, industrial areas uh, as, a, as a place to try and find um, space that are often multi-purpose um, and flexible and not close to residential um, places where things are more um, rigid and defined. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that there's lots of lots of um, opportunities to build community. I mean, you can also, perhaps more difficult, but it's also possible to, to, to create these spaces online. Um, I, I think of examples of uh, mix series like DJs making recordings and somebody curating and, archi and, and archiving it as a, as a type of community as well, um, albeit a virtual one. So uh, that can then lead to you know, the, the physical manifestation of it. Um, so yeah, U ultimately I would just say don't be afraid of making a mistake as the, as the 
the key thing to get it started. Um, another question that we have, um, again for Garrett, I guess, um, it's, it's something you touched on briefly in the beginning of the conversation, um, where you said, I guess, um, that you sometimes uh, change the program or the music program to, to make the neighborhood feel welcome. Um, how did you approach this and, and how did the, the regular audience maybe respond or can you maybe elabor elaborate a bit on, on that thing you, you said? Um, sure. So we are in a neighborhood that is predominantly Spanish um, and as a means of making the space um, feel open to, to um, um, people from that uh, um, demographic, we looked, uh, tried to engage with um, DJs and producers and promoters who um, cater to people with a preference for um, um, reggaeton, bachata, salsa, um, more like traditionally um, Latin forms of, of um, music and, and, and art. So that was, that was, uh, that was our, uh, the, the, the thought behind um, getting people who like music and who live in the neighborhood interested in, in, in coming down to the space. Um, we don't always have DJs here. Um, we also have playlists. So with the playlists and things, things we put together and try and incorporate um, sort of things that um, would appeal to, um, appeal to members from, from the immediate community. Um, it's not exclusively Spanish, it's mixed. It's, um, when I say Spanish, I mean Puerto Rican, Dominican, um, predominantly. Um, but this was just informed, you know, by the fact that I, I also live in the neighborhood. So as I'm walking to the grocery store or um, just whatever, hearing music from cars, um, all kinds of stuff, it, it, it's, it's educated me. And I've always tried to keep my ears open to um, um, the sounds of the, the community around me and um, hopefully have that reflected in, in the offering that we create um, I hear it nowadays. It doesn't always work, of course. Like there, there are there are people who who would who would it's that that, that that's that's not enough um, to 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 entice them. And then that's why I bring up the point about creating offerings in addition to the music that um, uh, appeal to appeal to them more broadly, like um, certain brand names that are recognizable. Um, one thing that I, I did when I was designing the menu um, was to go to the bodegas and the local grocery stores and just check and see what, ask them what the this beers that most people like or what tequila or what types of tequila that people in the neighborhood like, and then factor that into the the way we we, we put together the menu. Um, one last question, maybe. Um, it, it links a bit to the question that Tina said, actually, but um, it's about um, it's Brecht who asks, like, um, who's running a sort of young community-based radio station that started during the pandemic, and um, mainly the question is if you have any tips or relevant experience on how to to move further, but on not o not only staying in contact with uh, with the community, but al also sustain it and how to build to a sustainable model to have like this real to have a community sustaining the future as well, and yeah. Well, with us, it's like I think it's essential in 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 our functioning that we see nightlife as one thing among a much bigger ecosystem, um, because it enables us to also not expect everything from the nightlife. To, to, to take a bit of pressure off those nights that they don't have to be the metaphor for the whole thing and to see it as part of a much bigger energy where there is 
other spaces which consist of building the spaces and that can be a very participatory and an amazing way to reach out uh, there is employment which is a very very and often overlooked concrete way of communicating also with the community at large meaning you can pay people to work on the thing and and I guess for me, the, 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 also the last months where, where the, 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 the real partying was not so much um, happening or allowed. Um, I think the, this performativity of the nightlife, where as, as a space where you can appear and disappear and also be seen in a certain kind of fiction, I think that can be, that can exist within that ecosystem also outside of the nightlife meaning you can you can make you make you can make collective food events or building events which also incorporate that desire to be seen and to be fictionalized and to be performing yourself and so i guess what, I, what i'm saying is if you manage to make a bigger ecosystem than just the desire to party a lot of the um, a lot of the a lot of the human desires for what for which we go to parties can also be part of of, of those other uh, activities or there's other energies which form form our 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 network thanks yeah if, if nobody else wants to add into that and i think that that was the last question um Do you mind repeating the question I might have something on it. Yeah, of course. Um, the question is, what was how do you how do you um, practice? Actually, Colin, he, he started a young radio station, but I guess it, it goes for a lot of communities out there. How do you sustain uh, a community so it so you can keep on building it and sustaining it throughout the upcoming months or years? Uh, so yeah, how do you successfully sustain your project? It's, right, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but like and uh, and. Um, I guess you kind of have to have an obsession with, with delivering something quality and, and keeping people engaged. If you, if you drop off and, and um, don't put as much energy or attention into it and the, the quality of the product suffers um, or the output or whatever it is you're creating, I think that, that, can, um, that that's the, the, the main deterrent. And I think the clear messaging about what the, the, the values of the, the programming or the, the, the radio station, um, what it represents is, is, is important and sticking to those um, and being able to clearly relay them. Um, so, yeah, I would say to just approach it with a, with a try and set some long-term goals for it and approach it with a, um, a mindset that, it, that, it's, that it's here to stay and, and um, try and make as many connections with people who are in the same field um if if that is the case um i mean i, I say that is if that is the case physically but also virtually like reach out to other radio stations get their perspective on how they were able to um you know develop and grow people who you're um inspired by and who you would like to to learn from more often than not if you ask people they're very very willing to share um those pers per perspectives it goes kind of back to what i was saying about um people feeling shy or people feeling like they can't reach out or like they're going to not say the right thing or they don't know enough they're going to make a mistake just drop all that and like ask the dumb question if you think you need to ask it like don't be don't be shy about asking people for for help and insights um and that will eventually form a connection with that person um or it might not happen with it with everybody but i think more often than not in my experience um you have you're widening your network and that is what it takes to in my experience to to continue to deliver and um, build upon what you already have so think big and 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 um, work hard at it all right thanks I think that was the last question for you actually so um yeah, I've I've been following it and a lot of people with me, so it was a very, very, very interesting discussion. Thanks for everybody for, for sharing that much. Um it was really insightful and educational. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot.
thanks for, for having me. I had fun. And it was really cool to hear your perspective, Joseph and, and Teo too. And um, yeah, it would be it would be great to keep in to keep in touch if, if you guys ever make it to New York when all of this mm. shit comes. Um, uh, it, would be, it would be an honor to host you. I have a lot of respect for what, what you both do and uh, commend you for it. Thanks. Yeah, I learned a lot also from, uh, from talking to all of you. So it was really a uh, really my my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was really nice to hear all these different perspectives. And yeah, I think I came away from this uh, learning, you know, learning quite a bit. So yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, from different cities, like from Brussels to Kampala and to New York, we have discussed this community thing around the world, how it interacts in between itself around the neighborhood and the urban context, and then fashion production itself, how it affects all these processes. And thank you, Tayo, Joseph, and Garrett for sharing your experiences and ideas. And I'm really happy that we focused on this more practical side so that this kind of co-learning also could occur in between us. So also thanks mm -hmm. for all of you. Yeah, and good, good luck to all of you. Yeah, particularly to you, Teo. I know that your circumstances in Kampala are so, so different to what we're dealing with in, in, yeah. in New York and in, in Brussels. And your job is so much more difficult than, than what, what we're facing. So, like, nothing but um, the best wishes and, and um, maximum support. And if you ever think that there's anything that, um, that we can do to help, I would be so, so glad to. So just don't be, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, yeah. All right. But, like, Thank Max, you. It's a huge undertaking and, and um, amazing work. Thank you. I'll stay in touch, definitely. Yeah. And likewise, of course, Joseph, best of luck to you too with, with, with everything, challenging times. And thank you to Horst as well, because I know that you guys are very committed and have been for a very long time and are doing tremendous work as well. So good job. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. We learned very much from you. Thank you very much. Have a, awesome. have a good evening or a good continuation of the day there, Garrett. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.